Okay, this is not a picture of your instructor. This is a picture of Gregory Mendel. I'm not this old. Uh, Gregory Mendel is, of course, the father of genetics. Uh, during the time of Gregory Mendel, no one knew anything about DNA. No one knew anything about genes. Uh, the concept of reproduction was still, was still in an evolutionary process. And Gregory Mendel major objective was trying to understand how traits were passed from parents to offspring. Can you predict mathematically what will occur when you do a cross between one organism and the other organism with respect to, to given characteristics? Now Mendel developed a very interesting model. Uh, the model he used was the pea plant, traits or characteristics that, that were uh, easily seen in the pea plant. Now, as you can see, the pea plant has a number of interesting traits. First of all, we can look at seed shape, which is a trait. The seed shape may be smooth or may be wrinkled. Seed color may be yellow or green. And on and on we can see that all of the given, given I'm sorry, all of the given characteristics were either, were either one way or another. Today we'll look at, today we'll look at Mendel's work and we can easily see that some of the characteristics in a given trait were either dominant and we'll put a big D by that, or they were recessive, and we put a small d by that. Today we understand that these given traits were, uh, were influenced and directed, I should say, by genes. So we're going to, we're going to look at Mendelian, Mendelian genetics. Now Mendelian genetics makes an important assumption, an assumption that two genes are responsible for a given trait. There's a dominant gene and a recessive gene. And these genes are present on pairs of chromosomes. Remember, a homologous pair of chromosome has one chromosome from one parent and one chromosome from another parent. And all of us basically are a composite of homologous chromosomes, each of our parents basically working together to influence a given, uh, I should say, influence all of our characteristics. For a moment, let's look at the process, uh, let's look at the model that Mendel developed. In the pea plant, we can see that the plant uh, has the organ uh, for fertilization, uh, the plant itself can self-fertilize because the male and the female parts are present on the same organ. And once the ovaries are mature, the ovaries will form seeds, and each seed is basically an embryo. And the seeds now can be planted, of course, and the seeds will now, uh, uh, will now develop into a full plant with all of the characteristics that one needs to study. Again, remember, each seed is an, is an embryo. Now Mendel's uh, pea plant test model looks something like this. To avoid self-pollinization, what he did was he took out the uh, pollen structures in a plant, and he now could transfer pollen from one plant to the stigma of another plant. So basically he developed a nice system for doing uh, crosses uh, between plants and these crosses were designed to study what new characteristics would come up. As you're looking up here we see that we have two plants. One has green seeds and one has yellow seeds. And doing a cross between green uh, seeds and yellow seeds, he comes up and he gets the offspring of all yellow seeds. 
Now, why should he get all yellow seeds? What happened to the green seeds? Well, this is where we're going with all of this. Key terms in genetics. Again, Mendel did not have a full grasp of all of this. Today, we see this quite clearly. We understand that dominant genes occur. We recessive genes occur. The dominant gene will always override a recessive gene. If a dominant gene and a recessive gene come up together, the dominant gene wins out and that particular characteristic will show up. The only way a recessive gene can show up is if the dominant gene is not present or two recessive genes are present. Okay, now we understand the basics of, of the genes and the genes are present on, on homologous chromosomes. Now let's understand what we mean by genotype. Genotype is the genetic makeup of an organism. And the genotype will be present in all of the cells of an organism. The phenotype is how that genetics is going to be expressed. For example, if the genotype for tallness is big T and little t, and the plant is tall, the tallness is the phenotype. So again, phenotype is the expression of the genes. Now the term alleles is basically synonymous with genes. Alleles really defined are different forms of the same gene. In this case, we're looking at big B and little b. Big B and little b, each gene is present on different chromosomes, but together they form alleles. In, in essence, I will use genes and alleles synonymously. The term Punnett square. Punnett square is nothing more than a simple little model for predicting a cross, a cross between one organism with, with a given set of traits and another organism with a given set of traits that we are studying. Now, my object, see, the object of, of this particular uh, exercise is to at least get you to appreciate how to do a simple monohybrid cross using single traits, as you can see, big B little b times big B little b, and a dihybrid cross. And, it, and a dihybrid cross where we're looking at two characteristics. In this case, as you can see, big B little b represents one trait, big S little s represents another trait, and we're going to be doing a cross between two organisms that have this particular genotype. So let's for a moment, since we'll be using this model, let's look at the, uh, the given two traits. And the two traits I'm looking at are the, are the texture of the peas. We have peas that have a smooth and rough texture. And we also have peas that are yellow and peas that are green. So we're looking at two traits, texture and color. And this was one of the major characteristics that allowed Mendel to come up with some of his rather ingenious uh, mathematical models in genetics. Let's now look at how Mendel did his work. In, now Mendel was basically trying to understand the mathematics behind crosses and what kind of characteristics would be passed on from one generation to another generation. Now, in the model we're looking at over here, we're going to do a cross of a homozygous dominant, which means that this particular organism has two chromosomes with two big Ys, which means the dominant genes are present on the homologous chromosomes. And then we're going to do a cross between this pea plant and another pea plant that's homozygous recessive, little y's. 
the overall trait, of course, is color. So yellow is dominant over green. So as you can see, all of our big Y, big Y, big Y, big Y, all will be yellow. And where little y's appear, they're going to be green. Now, in doing a cross, we have to understand that what we're doing is looking at how gametes are formed. And when we have a pool of gametes that are formed by a given parent, and, the, and these gametes start to come together during fertilization, what is going to be the probability of a given offspring? And this is essentially what genetic recombination is. It's a way of looking at what is going to be the chance that two gametes come together and produce a given characteristic. So let's see how this process works. As, if you remember, we spent a lot of time looking at this in this chapter, we discussed meiosis. Now, as you can see, uh, our plant with the, with the yellow peas and our plant with the green peas, each are, one is dominant and one is recessive in the respective plants. Plant to your left with the yellow seeds will be producing gametes, and the gametes it will produce can only be big Y and big Y, as you can see to the left. So during the process of meiosis, this is the only possible gametes that are going to be produced, big Y and big Y. Now, to the right, you see, we have a plant that has two little Ys only, and because they have the recessive genes, the little Y, they can only make little y gametes. So the plant to the right, the male in this case, is making only two little y's. So what we've done is put together a little box that tells you the possible outcome of a fertilization. Now, as you can see the way this particular model shows you, the male possible gametes are put on the top and the female possible gametes are put on to the left. So therefore, when fertilization takes place, you have big Y, little Y, big Y, little Y, possible combination. Remember, we're going from one end to two end during the fertilization process. Recombination takes place. Again, if you look down further, we have big Y, little Y, and big Y, little Y. So when we, this is basically referred to, and I will, I will come back to this in a moment, as a Punnett square. A little square that allows you to put together the possible combination of gametes you will get in the offspring. So in this case, my goodness, if you look carefully, you can see that the only possible combination you can get from these gametes are going to be big Y, little Y, big Y, little Y, big Y, little Y. So as you can see, the F1 generation is going to be all big Y, little Y, big Y, little Y, and they're all going to be yellow. So this is essentially what Mendel's process, and the, it were, this is essentially the way Mendel's model worked. So if we can get a little appreciation for this, let's kind of go to the next slide. Okay, and this, okay, here what I'm going to do is review what we just saw in the model that Mendel used. Now, pay close attention. This is going to be a, uh, a little bit different in the sense that we're going to be doing a mono-hybrid cross and learning how to do the Punnett square. The Punnett square, as you can see, is a square. A square designed to show you how gametes combine and the probability of the combination that might take place to start with. In a monohybrid cross, the big Y represents alleles for yellow seed. The little Y represents alleles for green seed. Now, the cross that we will be doing is we're going to be doing a cross between two organisms. One 
has the genotype, big Y, little y, and the other one will also have the genotype, big Y, little y. And we write this as a cross, big Y, little y, times big Y, little y. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to put, assign one as the male and one as the female. If we put the male on the left, the male can produce the following gametes. Remember, the male is going to be 2N. During the process of meiosis, the male is going to be producing gametes. And the gametes will be, will only have one N. So therefore, Y will be one possible gamete, and little y will be another possible gamete. There's no other possibilities because only one gene ends up in a given sperm. So, as you can see to the left, we got big y, little y. Well, it turns out that the genotype for the female is also big y, little y. Therefore, the gametes will also come up to be big y, little y. So now we see the possible gametes that are being formed by the female and the possible gametes that are going to be formed by the male. Remember, all of this takes place during meiosis. So now we have gametes to the left, gametes to the right, male, uh, male to the left, female on top. During the process of fertilization, look, what, look at the possibilities. Big Y, big Y, that's going to be homozygous dominant yellow. Big Y, little y, heterozygous means big Y, little y, hetero means one of each, heterozygous, also yellow. Why yellow? Because the big Y dominates the little y. To the bottom left, we also get big Y, little y combination. Again, it's going to be yellow. And finally, you see to the right, two little y's come together. So this is the mathematical probability of, gam of the gametes that will be formed during this cross and the possibility of, the, of, the, uh, of fertilization and the offsprings and the characteristics that they will uh, show. But if you look carefully, what do we have here? First of all, let's review what we mean by genotype. We have three genotypes here. We have big Y, big Y, big Y, little Y, and little Y, little Y. So those are three genotypes. But how many phenotypes do we have? Remember, phenotypes is the expression of the genetics. We have three yellow and one green. And you can see why that is the expression of my genotypes. Here's an important point to remember. You can always tell the phenotype, but you can never tell, you can never be certain of the genotype. So I'm looking at my three genotypes, big Y, big Y, big Y, little Y, big Y, little Y. I know they're all yellow, but I cannot tell without understanding the genetic, without understanding the genetics, what the genotype is until I do some uh, complicated uh, crosses. So let's now, the model that we just looked at, let's analyze what is really happening at the chromosome level. Analyzing chromosome pairs. I've used some terms here perhaps that I need to define more carefully. Homozygous dominant. This is where you have two dominant genes that are present. Homozygous recessive. This is where you have two recessive genes present. And heterozygous is when you have a, a dominant gene and a recessive gene. Of course, the dominant gene is going to override the recessive gene. When we did a, uh, a uh, monohybrid cross, we basically did a cross between two heterozygous organisms. So let's look at what we got before. At the, at the genetic, at the chromosome level. If you look at the big Y, big Y yellow seeds, what do we get there? At the chromosomes, the homologous pair both have dominant yellow 
genes. In the heterozygous, we have also a yellow seed, but I have no idea what's in there, except if I look carefully, I see that one of my homologous pair is going to be, ha is going to have a recessive gene, and one's going to have a big dominant gene. And again, to the right, you can see that the homologous pair and the homozygous recessive are going to be two little Y's, two little green genes are basically put together, and that controls that particular trait. So please look at this, understand what, homolo what homologous dominant heterozygous, please understand what homozygous dominant heterozygous and homozygous recessive uh, genetics looks like, understand what a genotype is and what the phenotype is. Now we get into something that gets a little bit more complex, but it really shouldn't be because we're basically doing the same thing. In this case, we're going to be looking at two traits, which means we have two sets of chromosomes. In this case, we're going to be looking, and you can pretty much ignore, if you want to, the, the material to the left and focus on the material to your right, why Mendel got the results he got. Look, look at a cross of two traits. To my left, as you can see on the P generation, we have a P that has a genotype, big S, big S, big Y, big Y. That means smooth yellow. Homozygous dominant for smooth and homozygous dominant for yellow. To your right, we're going to be doing a cross with a homozygous recessive. Two little S's, two little Y's, and the, this is going to be wrinkled green. So we've got two characteristics again, color and texture. So when we take this, this organism, basically, of plants and organism, when we take this genotype, and do this combination in a Punnett square, we have to ask ourselves, how is this uh, independent assortment of genes going to work out, and what's going to be the answer to this particular combination? The first thing we do is we put together, as you can see to the bottom, 16 squares, rather than four that we saw before. Again, we are going to make gametes, and the gametes are going to be used in, in predicting the outcome of crosses. The big S, big S, big Y, big Y, what's the possible gamete combination that can sort out? Remember, one of each trait will end up in a gamete. So the only possibility is that you're going to get a big S, and a big Y ending up in a sperm. On the other side, we can get a small S and a small Y ending up in a, in a uh, egg. So the only possibility of the gametes, as you can see, is big S, big Y, and little S, little Y. There's no other possibilities. So during meiosis, this is the kind of gametes we form. So, as we if we do this combination, we see that we end up with big S, little s, and big Y, and little y, and that's 100% of the, uh, that's, that will be 100% of the time you're going to get up with, 100% of the time you're going to end up with yellow smooth. Okay, now that we have this particular genotype and this particular phenotype, I'm looking at big S, little s, big Y, little y. And now we're going to do the Punnett square. The, but this, this time, notice that we have 16 squares. So let's see what, how do we go through this process. We have the genotype big S, little s, big Y, little y. What are the possible gametes that can be formed? If I do a cross between 
big S, little s, big y, little y, and another organism that is identical. So look, look at my cross to the left. My cross is between two organisms. Big S, little s, big y, y, little y, times big S, little s, big y, little y. Now, since both have the exact same genotype, the gametes are going to be, this, are going to be identical. So let's see what kind of eggs we can form. We can form an egg that has big S, big Y, big S, little y, little S, little y, and little S, little y. On, to the, on the top, we're going, to get this, we're going to get identical possible gametes. Big S, big Y, big S, little y, little S, big Y, and little S, little y. So if this is the possible gametes that are going to result from this type of cross, which is a dihybrid cross, okay? You look to see what, what the end result is going to be. The end result is going, to, is going to look like this. We're going to get nine smooth yellow, three wrinkled yellow, three smooth green, and one wrinkled green. Okay, take a, take a break for a second, catch your breath. This is not easy stuff, but take your time and look through the actual results that Mendel got when he did his initial cross to get his dihybrid, which is big S, little s, big Y, little y, and then when he did that final cross to get his second generation, which gave him this 9331 phenotypic ratio. Why do we call it phenotypic? Because that's how it's expressed. You got nine smooth yellow, three wrinkled yellow, three smooth green, and one wrinkled green. Now, take a little time, look at this again. I would expect that you learn how to do a monohybrid cross and a dihybrid cross. See you in the lab. Okay, so let's now review again how a dihybrid cross was done. And this basically is the same material that we just covered. I just simply pulled it out for you and, sh and showed you uh, how we formed the gametes, the male gametes, how we formed the female gametes, and how this recombination occurs. Look at it carefully and, and understand that Mendel's mathematics works very well. You can, as long as the Mendelian assumption is maintained that genes are present, that you have dominant recessive genes, and the genes are present on homologous chromosomes, and meiosis works, then you're going to be able to predict mathematically what's going to happen, in this case, a dihybrid cross. In a dihybrid cross, you always get a 9331 phenotypic ratio. Unfortunately, we have variations in Mendelian genetics. We have incomplete dominance, we have co-dominance, we have polygenic inheritance, and we have gene and environmental influence. So let's touch on these for a moment. Uh, look at this example in terms of incomplete dominance. We have a red flower that has a genotype big R, big R. We have a white flower that has a genotype little r, little r. And we make the assumption that little r, little r is recessive, and big r, big r, of course, can be dominant. But look what happens when you do a cross between the two. You end up with a pink flower. Well, you expect big r to dominate over little r. But instead, what you have is incomplete dominance. Basically, you get a blending of the two. Now, if you not, if you want to convince yourself that both of the genetic, both of these genes are still present and can still express themselves, let's do a cross between a big R and a little r. On the top, you get a big R for one gamete, a little r for the other gamete. On the left, you get another r and a little r. Do your Punnett square, and look what happens. You get, suddenly, the red appears again, and the white appears again. So do you see how traits can be hidden? It's all in the genes. 
So look at this carefully and understand the concept of incomplete dominance. Now, Mendel did not understand this, but you guys do. Another variation in Mendelian genetics is co-dominance. In this case, let's look at a model that all of us are probably all of us probably have an interest in. Blood typing. All of us are familiar with type A blood, type B blood, type O blood, type AB blood. So what are we talking about here? If you look to the right, you see blood cells. You see that in type A blood, you have A protein on it. Basically, a protein that coats the uh, surface. In type B, you have a B protein that coats the surface. In type AB blood, we have both A and B protein as present. Oh my goodness, in type O blood, there's no protein whatsoever. It is naked as can be. So what controls these proteins? Remember, genes control the production of proteins. That's the hallmark of what we've been discussing all along, the basic principle of genetics and uh, DNA production is that DNA goes to RNA, RNA goes to protein. So genes control produ production of proteins. So now let's look at this business of co-dominance. There are three genes involved in the protein production on, in blood. Uh, IA gene controls the production of A protein, IB gene controls the production of B protein, and IA and IB gene, when present, both proteins are produced. So therefore, A does not dominate B, and B does not dominate A. And finally, when two little eyes come up, there's no protein produced. So as you can see, especially when we look at example uh, of blood type AB, we have the concept of codominance, which was not envisioned during Mendelian uh, work. Another concept that uh, is a little is quite different from Mendelian genetics is the concept of polygenic polygenic inheritance. Now I'm looking at height. Uh, I could also be looking at color. There are lots of characteristics that are due to many genes. Polygenic means many genes. So therefore, when certain groups of genes work together, it kind of depends the way the genes shuffle themselves as to whether you're going to be tall or short. All of us know of families that have uh, two tall parents and suddenly a little short individual comes up. Why is that? That's because height, color, and other care and intelligence are all a combination of many genes working together, and it just sort of depends on which shuffle works out as to what particular, yes, phenotype evolves. Another interesting variation to Mendelian genetics is the influence of the environment. Now, as you can see in this particular example, I have pink and white flowers. The reality is that both flowers have the same genotype. The same genetics is present in both flowers. Why is one flower pink, another flower white? Because the soil acidity is different in one area and another area. Therefore, the environment can have a significant influence on how a gene expresses itself or whether a gene expresses itself or not. Now, we have really looked at a complex subject. Uh, so let's summarize a couple of some key points. First of all, is that gametes have one end. When gametes combine, they form a new organism, and a new organism will have cells that will have two end. In doing Punnett squares, all we're doing is looking at a probability of what will happen when gametes that are produced by one parent 
come across gametes that are produced by another parent. When this recombination takes place, for the most part, we can, we can predict the probability of certain characteristics showing up by certain genes being dominant and certain genes being recessive. So genetics, to a great extent, is predictable. But backing up a little bit, genetics is quite complex, as we will see in the next chapter, that there are lots of variations that do not fall into simple Mendelian genetics. We just touched on a few of them. And in the next, chap in the next chapter, we're going to be looking at uh, genetic abnormalities, and we'll try to give you a better appreciation for, for some of the deviations or, or exceptions that occur in the concept of inheritance.